Well, as we're continuing our conversation about the qualifications of spiritual leaders, and I call the indication of somebody who has spiritual immaturity in Christ, um, I want to really kind of string together uh, three different terms that are interrelated. I, I can't really separate them one from another, so I want to talk about them in their relationship to one another. And that's where he says that a spiritual leader can't be violent, not violent, but gentle and not quarrelsome. Uh, the word violent, as it's used here, uh, at least according to Strong's Concordance, says it's ready with a blow, ready for a physical altercation, it's somebody who's pugnacious, contentious, somebody who's a quarrelsome person. In a sense, I would say it's somebody who is looking for a fight. They've got a chip on their shoulders, we used to say. They're, they're eager to get into an argument and to quarrel and, and to fight over things. Sometimes they just become very contentious and, and competitive individuals that everything is an argument. Now, I, I knew a gentleman once and uh, considered him a, a friend for many years, but it was, it was almost amazing how that no matter what anybody ever said, and he was very sharp theologically and a very great debater, he would turn it into an argument. It was almost like he had to prove you wrong theologically in, in order for him to feel comfortable. He had to demand that kind of control. And it's kind of unfortunate because it really led to him being extremely isolated and, and really put a tremendous limitation on what he was able to do in ministry because instead of being a, a co-laborer, you always found that eventually you were really kind of in a, a competitive relationship with this person. And I think it's one of those kind of things that uh, sometimes we just need to ask ourselves, are we being just unnecessarily competitive even within spiritual things? Because this is not an unknown uh, dynamic within the church. I mean, as a pastor, I've often had people who will come to me after a message or particularly they'll send me emails and stuff. And you can just tell that this is a person who just wants to get an argument. Uh, we refer to them as people who troll you on the internet. Uh, I'm not sure if that's always a fair characterization, but I just find that there's some people that never will let you have the last word. You know, they they ask you a question, what do you think about this? And so you give them an answer, and then they come back and say, yeah, but what about this? And you give them an answer, and then they say, yeah, but what about this? And it just goes on and on, and you realize... They're either terribly lonely people who have nobody else to talk to. Uh, they may be people who are socially inept. They don't know really how to interact in a healthy way with other people. Or there's those people who just are argumentative. They are people who are quarrelsome. And one of the things it says is those people should never be allowed to be in a position of, of leadership. Um, but it goes beyond just the, the verbal part of it. In fact, Wiersbe makes a really interesting comment in his commentary. He says, it's one who uses physical force to get people to agree with him. And we know that the wrath of man, even though we know the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, there are people who may not even touch you, but they will use their physical presence to try to intimidate you. You know, it's like we say to people, you're standing in my space. In our culture, uh, the normal space for conversation is about 24 inches. If you get closer to a person more than 24 inches, then you need to ask their permission. In other words, that's kind of the intimacy zone for people. Now, it's different from different cultures. I used to have to explain to gentlemen all the time when we were doing evangelism in Russia that in Russia, the intimate zone was about 12 inches. I mean, they would be witnessing to some uh, young, attractive young lady on the street sharing the gospel with her and, and and she would be looking intensely in their eyes, listening carefully, and, and, and being closer than 24 inches. And I had many of these guys think that now this girl is flirting with me. She's in with me and, and all that sort of stuff. And I'd had to explain to it, no, that's just being polite. You're older. She's being uh, respectful. And that's, that's the way they do it in their culture. It doesn't mean that she's, she likes you. But at the same time, we need to understand that every culture has its different zone of intimacy. And in America, it's about 24 inches. You get much closer than that, and people are going to feel like you're intruding into their space. And there are some people who understand that. They, they know that, and they actually use that to intimidate, intimidate and to control other people. So they may never touch you, but they'll really get in your face, as we say. And that should never be the quality of a, of a spiritual leader unless... He or she is doing it to defend someone else who is being threatened. 
Sometimes you have to step in between two people in order to get somebody to back off who's just pushing on too hard. Because usually those kind of people are bullies and they take advantage of people who they know are emotionally or physically weaker than them. And so they really bear down on them. And sometimes people like you and I have to really kind of get in between them and say, wait a minute, you need to step back and you need to tone it down and you need to get yourself under control. Uh, you you don't have a right to use that tone or to be that kind of aggressiveness. And so, you know, for me, fortunately, I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have a a number of security people around me so that when those kind of people do uh, attempt things like that during a service, I have these people who are more than willing and ready to step in and, and uh, bring it to a, a conclusion rather, rather quickly. But my whole point is that that's, that's a personality type that doesn't even necessarily have to become physically aggressive. They can become verbally aggressive. There is such a thing as verbal abuse. There is such a thing of yelling and screaming and, and dominating somebody so much, overwhelming them so much with your, your voice and your presence and your pushing that you back them into a corner and they do feel like they're being subjected to a level of abuse. So it's important for us to recognize that uh, we're supposed to be known in contrast, he says, by our gentleness. Now, the word gentle that he uses here means that you're slow to anger. <clears throat> it means that you're fair-minded, that you're patient, you're being a good listener, that you're willing to hear both sides before reacting or drawing a judgment, that you're not looking to be in a fight or in a conflict. And I know that <clears throat> we all go through those times where uh, our feelings are hurt, uh, we're wounded by things that people say, or sometimes people say some very mean, aggressive things. And I'm not saying it's always wrong to come back strongly and basically really stop a person who's being overly verbally aggressive. I, sometimes you just have to really come back uh, pretty strongly verbally to get them to say, wait a minute, stop it right now. I'm not, <laughs> you, you can't do that. So that's wrong. What you just said was wrong. That's something that is not wrong, but at the same time, you don't have to be aggressive to the point where you're threatening to that other person. And that's where he ties into it, the idea of also not being quarrelsome. That, uh, again, as I mentioned it the other day, that we need to recognize when this conversation is going no place. <clears throat> A quarrelsome person uh, doesn't really care if the discussion or conversation is going any place. They just want to keep the conversation going in the style that they have it. They're ventilating a lot of hostility and anger on the inside. They're not really willing to talk to you or have a conversation. I think one of the ways I see it so uh, illustrated within our culture, I remember seeing Barack Obama, uh, you know, you know, reacting to Trump's statement that he was a terrible president. And he then he said to the camera, at least I'll be the president. And he had the microphone and then he drops it. And it, it's kind of like a, when you drop the mic, you've made this ultimate statement. I, I don't know if he had to go back and pick up the microphone when Trump was elected as president or not, but the whole point was it's this kind of way of using a conversation to put people in their place, to put people down. And as tempting as that may be, uh, it's something we need to be careful that we don't do just for the sake of doing it. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying there's never a time not really to, to kind of respond in a way that... M really clarifies the moment. For example, I had a, a pastor friend of mine who was at a family dinner and his, his wife's relatives were uh, all atheists and very aggressively anti-Christian. And here he was a pastor. And uh, he had this gentleman who was sitting next to him in the family kept on saying, you know, I believe in evolution. Uh, under his breath, basically, there's no God, is there eating dinner, you know, yeah, he says, and he was going through these kind of statements, and finally the guy said, uh, man came from monkeys, and my friend turned to him and looked at him and said, now, that statement I agree with, <laughs> I thought it was very clever because he's really essentially saying, because you're acting like one right now. He didn't have to call the man a moron. He just really responded by saying, I agree with what you're saying right there, because implied that you're acting like a moron. I don't think those kind of responses are wrong. In fact, if you read Jesus's words, many times he took people's comments and turned them around and really made them uh, look in the mirror of what they were saying to bring that conviction into their life. But the whole point is we're trying to make a point. When we have a conversation, we might even call an argument or a, a quarrel, but when we're going back and forth, if there is no point that we're trying to get to, if there's no point of healing and reconciliation and reconciliation, and we're just wanting to get in somebody's face, 
then we need to start really praying that God would heal inside of us what's broken. Because that's really an indication of something that's broken on the inside of us. And I would say that particularly in marriage relationships, because sometimes husbands and wives just kind of say things that are kind of harsh and unkind, and all they are is a ventilation of maybe some inner angst that's going on in their life. We need to not only recognize our propensity to do that, but also we need to be willing to ask for forgiveness when we do that. Um, Of course, I've run out of time. We'll continue on tomorrow. God bless you.